now, if I could, we have Megan Argo. We, we've heard about the 200 years of the past, we've heard about the present, and she's going to tell us about the, the blink of an eye in the next 200 years. So, thank you very much, Megan. Thank you. So, while I get set up, I will say, yes, like Anton, this is the second time that I've given a talk in here. Um, and like Anton, I'm a little bit intimidated because this is a slightly ambitious title, as many people, including my boss, who's at the back there, have pointed out. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm not quite sure why I let myself get talked into things like this. Um, so, I'm going to attempt to tell you something about what we think might happen in the next 200 years in astronomy. Um, I'll be honest with you up front, um, this is rather an ambitious title and the best prediction I can make is that everything I say is going to be wrong, <laughs> um, but at least that prediction is correct, I hope. Anyway, um, so utterly unrealistic predictions for astronomy in the next 200 years would possibly be a more realistic title, but I'll give it a go. Um, so we've already had a great history of the society from Alan Chapman earlier. But how far have we come in the field of astronomy since the founding of the RAS? Now, I could have picked so many different things here, but here is just some of the amazing things that have happened in the last 200 years of astronomy. Bear in mind that 200 years ago, we didn't have relativity. We didn't have Maxwell's equations. We definitely didn't have radio astronomy or X-ray astronomy. We didn't have multi-wavelength astronomy. All we had were mirrors and optics, pretty much. And in that time, we have discovered the first distance to, first distance has been measured to a, an object outside the solar system. This is 61 Cygni, um, measured to be 3.3 parsecs away by Bessel. Um, we've had the discovery of radio waves, obviously, and then following that, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation. We've gone from having the planets in the solar system to having now over 4,000 confirmed exoplanets around other stars. Now, that is quite an impressive tally just in the last 20 odd years. We've had the first image of a black hole. We had black holes predicted and then actually uh, visually verified. And we've had gravitational waves as well. Now, there are so many different things that I could have put on this slide. This is just some of the impressive things that have happened. Now, some of the stuff that's happened in the last 200 years is still ongoing. One of my favorite ongoing missions is the Voyager program. Voyagers 1 and 2 have now both left the sphere of the sun's influence and have gone out into interstellar space. And they're both traveling at over three astronomical units per year. Right? Just, just have a think about how fast that is. They're going to keep going. Unfortunately, the power that they have on board, it's a, it's a plutonium-238 um, radioisotope thermal generator. Those generators have got, well, obviously the plutonium has a half-life of about 86 years. So at the moment, they've only got about 57% of the energy that they had when they first launched. So these things are running out of power. NASA have already turned off several of the instruments on board these things, and they're going to keep turning them off as the power diminishes. So they will continue to travel pretty much forever mm -hmm. until they crash into something, possibly, in the very, very distant future, way further than 200 years. Um, but they will probably only continue sending data back to us for about the next five or six years, at which point they'll just run out of power. But they will keep going. And in about, I looked this one up, 296,000 years, Voyager 2 will pass within four and a half light years of Sirius. So that's the direction it's heading. So next time you look at the night sky and you see Orion and you see Sirius coming over the horizon, just think about Voyager 2 heading off in that direction. So that's the last two, 200 years in two slides. Where are we going next? Um, again, I could make so many predictions. They would probably all turn out to be wrong. Um, but one prediction I think is fairly safe is that we, we now have reusable rockets. That is going to make launching spacecraft so much cheaper, so much easier. So space telescopes, if you want to be building space telescopes, it's going to get a lot easier to put a telescope into space, which I think is really exciting. Now, this is a difficult thing to predict, what's going to happen in the next 200 years. So like every self-respecting astronomer my age, um, I didn't ask the astronomical community, I asked Twitter. <laughs> because that's what we do. This is a word cloud of the responses that I got from people on Twitter, some of whom were professors in astronomy. So it wasn't just, you know, random people. There were some professors in here as well. But you can see, the bigger the word, the more responses contained that word. So pretty much everybody is thinking we're going to find life somewhere. Now, some people said we're going to find bacteria in, under the regolith of Mars. 
Some people said we'll find it under the ice of Enceladus or Europa. Um, a lot of people think we're going to have colonies on the moon. A lot of people think we're going to be putting telescopes on the moon. I'll come to that again a bit later. So <coughs> how are the planned telescopes and space missions, space missions that we've got on the cards going to live up to these expectations of the wider community, including amateur astronomers and people who are not amateur astronomers but are just interested in astronomy? So I've selected a few projects that are upcoming that I think are particularly interesting. If you ask any other person in this room to give this talk, they'd probably pick different missions, right? Because we all have our own favorite objects, our fam favorite aspects of astronomy. So this is just the things that I think are particularly interesting. So I make no apologies for that. Um, this is a totally biased view. So one of the projects I'm very interested in is ExoMars. Now ExoMars has been around for a while. ExoMars, in fact, it's a, it's a joint ESA and Roscosmos mission. And in 2016, they sent um, this guy. This is <coughs> the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is a satellite that's been orbiting Mars for a few years. There is still there, and is part of the mission that will include the rover as well. The rover is scheduled for launch this year. And I have a soft spot for this rover because back when I was a summer student at the Anglo-Australian Observatory, as it was then, during my undergraduate degree in 2003, um, I worked on a proposal for a, an instrument for this rover. We didn't get it, um, but still it was quite exciting. So I've been watching this for ages, looking forward to the day when it actually launches. And it should go up this year. This thing is incredible. It's going to go around Mars, it's going to trundle around quite slowly, but it has the capability to drill two metres down into the surface. Collect samples, bring them back up, put them into a series of images and spectrographs and analyse those samples on board. One of the reasons for doing this is to look at the geology, look at the mineralogy, look for biomarkers, look for traces of life in the Martian regolith, but also to test the technology. At some point, we want to do a sample return from Mars. If we can get this right, sample return is the next step. So this mission is one to watch, in my opinion. Now, I know some of these are technically geophysics, but please forgive me for that. Astronomy, geophysics, it's all one thing in the RIS anyway. So the next one that I've got on my list is JUICE, which is going to the Jupiter system. And JUICE is a joint ESA-NASA project. A lot of these missions, a lot of these telescopes that I'm going to talk about are big projects. They're funded by multiple organizations, multiple countries, because big projects are the way we do things now, a lot of the time. <coughs> so JUICE is going to go to Jupiter via several flybys of the inner solar system. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to speed this movie up, because it's a beautiful visualization. Can I speed this up? No, I can't speed this up. Interesting. Okay. Um, oh, well, we'll just have to watch it as far as it gets. Um, this is a nine-minute movie. So go look this up if you want to see the whole thing, because it goes through. This was produced by a student they had at um, working at ESA for, I think it was a summer. Um, so this shows you the trajectory of the spacecraft as it goes through several slingshots, several gravity assist maneuvers in the inner solar system before heading out to Jupiter. Its launch date should be, hopefully, in 2022. Uh, and it will arrive at Jupiter in 2029, after all these flybys. So it's quite a long time before it actually gets there. It's going to study Jupiter as the archetype of the gas giants, because now we're finding so many exoplanets. A lot of the planets we're finding are gas giants. We want to understand Jupiter better, because it's the closest example that we have. It's also going to look at the interaction between Jupiter and the moons. <coughs> One of the interesting things it's going to do is going to do flybys of the larger of Jupiter's moons. So we're going to get close-up images, closer than we've ever had before, of several of Jupiter's moons. It's going to do a couple of close flybys of Europa to look at the surface structures, look at the ice on the surface of Europa, um, as well as Callisto. And then Ganymede. Ganymede is the only known moon in the solar system to have a magnetosphere. So the interaction between the magnetosphere of Ganymede and the magnetosphere of Jupiter is an interesting connection, and that's one of the things that this probe is going to look at. Now, I don't claim to be an expert at all in this, but I think it's really exciting that we're going to look at that. I think the results we're going to, are going to be really fascinating. Eventually, this poor spacecraft is going to run out of fuel. It's going to go into an orbit around Ganymede. The first time we've sent a spacecraft into the orbit of a moon around another planet. So again, another first. And at the end of its mission, when it runs out of fuel, it's going to go into an orbit that takes it basically on a grazing trajectory of the surface, and it's basically going to just slowly crash on the surface of Ganymede. So we'll get some really close-up images before it comes to an end. So I'm going to stop the movie there. So those are some 
solar system missions. What about space telescopes? What about looking at the rest of the universe outside the solar system? Well, one of the, the big telescopes that we're hoping will get launched at some point is the James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, this should already be in space, right? It's been a very long time in coming. This began development in 1996. Um, it's now scheduled, as far as I'm, I understand it, for m launch in March 2021. So keep your fingers crossed for that one. It's been postponed several times already. It has a six and a half meter mirror. This thing weighs half the mass of Hubble. It's got half the mass of Hubble, um, but it's got five times the collecting area. Now it doesn't cover the same wavelengths as the Hubble Space Telescope does. A lot of people call this telescope the successor to Hubble, kind of, but it is gonna do slightly different things. A large part of where it's gonna work is sort of the orange part of the visible spectrum through to the, the infrared. And some of the reasons for doing that is you want to look at the very early galaxies. You want to see the very first galaxies forming in the universe, the high redshift stuff. And to do that, you need to look in the infrared and longer wavelengths because the light from those distant objects has been redshifted so much out of the visible spectrum, out of where it was originally transmitted, down into these longer wavelengths. So we're hoping that the James Webb Space Telescope, one of the key science drivers for this telescope, is to look at the formation of the first stars and galaxies at high redshift. We also want to look at cold gas and dust. That's something you can do really well in the infrared. These things emit, but they emit at long wavelength radiation, so they show up really well in the infrared. The James Webb Space Telescope will help us look at star formation, planet formation within the Milky Way. And also, hopefully, lead to direct imaging of exoplanets and various other things. So it's going to be a really exciting telescope. And this in conjunction with some of the other fantastic telescopes that we already have. Multi-wavelength astronomy is a fantastic thing. We can combine all that data together. We can understand the universe a whole lot better. Another telescope I'm really excited about coming up is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Again, there are bigger optical telescopes on the cars, but this one in my mind is one of the most exciting because this one shows you the power of surveys. This telescope has an 8.4 meter primary mirror, a very short focal length. It's a very short stubby telescope. It surveys the sky fast. This telescope has a 3.2 gigapixel camera made up of 189 individual CCDs, a focal plane that's 64 centimeters across, which is pretty big, uh, and a field of view on the sky of three and a half degrees. The moon is half a degree across, so this is a large patch of the sky. And it's gonna be taking images of 15 second exposures every 20 seconds, every night that it's operating. So this telescope is gonna be producing over 200,000 images per year we're going to be dealing with 1.28 petabytes of data coming from just this one telescope every year. Now, Galaxy Zoo does a fantastic amount with large data sets, but I think even they will struggle with this. To deal with the data coming from these telescopes, we need good pipelines. We need good, automated, well-calibrated pipelines that can deal with those data reliably and send alerts to astronomers for things that are genuinely interesting and worthy of follow-up rather than just saying, look, here's something exciting, and then we look at it and go, oh, it's a satellite. I'll get to that. <laughs> so again, a lot of the science cases for these telescopes are quite similar. What is this telescope aiming to do? Study dark energy, study the structure of the universe, looking at weak gravitational lensing, something that you need large areas of the sky to do. It's going to look at supernovae as a function of redshift. And that helps us tell something about how the universe is expanding, whether it's accelerating or not. Mapping small objects in the solar system we're obviously hoping that in the next 200 years we don't have an asteroid that comes and wipe us out. That was something that came up on Twitter a couple of times. Telescopes like this will help us catalogue those small minor objects in the solar system much better than we currently have. And we'll understand where they are, what they are, and what their orbits are, and then we can predict where they're going to be in the future. Plus lots of other things. This is going to pick up a huge number of transients, and again, those pipelines will tell us what to follow up and which things are, are interesting. This is going to keep astronomers very, very busy for quite some time. The data from this telescope will keep us busy for far longer than the telescope is actually operating. And that's the feature of a lot of these new, new facilities. Now, the one that I'm going to be most involved with is, is the Square Kilometre Array. I'm a radio astronomer, for those of you that don't know me well. This is an artist's impression of the Square Kilometre Array that I've massacred. The original one had an optical picture of the Milky Way in the background, which I thought was a bit silly. So I photoshopped in a picture of the radio Milky Way, which makes much more sense to me. And that picture was actually taken, it was released just last year, and it's taken by Meerkat, which is a telescope currently made up of 64 antennas. Each of them looks like, like this one, in South Africa. 
and it's one of the precursor telescopes to the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array. The Square Kilometre Array, incidentally, has also been in the planning stages since 1996. It was originally devised as a telescope to just study neutral hydrogen, but it's become big and massive and all things to every astronomer, so now it's going to do an awful lot more. So you'll notice here that there are two types of, well, three types of antennas. You've got this type of antenna, this type of antenna, and this type of antenna. These guys work at high radio frequencies. These work at low radio frequencies. This telescope has become such a monster and covering such a large range of radio wavelengths that you can't do it with one type of antenna technology. So dishes plus dipoles gives you the whole spectrum. And it's also got so big that it covers two continents. So the dishes, some of the dishes are in South Africa. There's another load of dishes being built in Western Australia. And there's a huge array of dipoles going up in Western Australia as well. This is a mega project. And again, it's going to look at galaxy evolution, the evolution of the universe. It's going to look at cosmology. It's going to look at strong tests of gravity using pulsars and black holes. That's one thing you can do really well in the radio. Um, and looking at the cosmic dawn, how were the first black holes and stars formed in the early universe? You see a theme here. A lot of the same questions are coming up with a lot of these telescopes. Um, and it's also going to go looking for life. One of the other science cases is, are we alone in the universe? Can we see radio signals coming from other civilizations? We've been broadcasting radio waves into the universe since we invented radio waves. If there are aliens out there, they're probably doing the same thing in our direction. If you're going to pick them up, you need a big telescope. This is a big telescope. If they're out there, this might spot them. Might. So we've got lots of nice telescopes coming along. But that doesn't mean that we're going to have the whole of astronomy solved in the next 200 years. We've got problems that we have to deal with as well. Data rate is one of them. The SKA is going to generate vast amounts of data as well. One of the major problems that we have imminently is satellites. I said that I'd come back to this. This is a picture from Cerro Tololo in Chile showing the observatory there with a nice streak, which I hope you can see, of satellites going through the image. This is one of the Starlink launches from SpaceX. These things are bright. They're brighter than even SpaceX were expecting them to be. And it's sunlight reflecting back from largely from their solar panels. And they're launching them on a regular basis for quite a while. And unfortunately for the likes of us, it's only going to get worse. This is a picture, this is a field from, from the DCAM survey um, showing you what happens when these satellites pass through your field of view while you're observing. <coughs> Now, you can still see the sky, sure, but you've got an awful lot of stuff in the way that you have to deal with. If you're, gonna, if you're looking for transients, these are a problem because your pipeline's going to spit every single one of those out and go, oh, like I found something. Now, Elon Musk has, he wants to launch 12,000 satellites by mid-2020. He has approval for that already. That's going to happen. Um, but he also wants to la launch another 30,000, and he's going through the approval process for that at the moment. So this is going to get much worse. And it's not just SpaceX. There are several other big companies that want to do the same thing. So on the plus side, universal internet. Fantastic. I've yet to come across a single aid agency that says, yes, people in the poorest parts of Africa need internet more than they need clean drinking water. But there you go. So, universal internet, fantastic, but it's going to cause us a huge problem, not just in the optical. This is a big headache for radio astronomers as well. Basically, radio telescopes, if you've got telescopes that are close together, they're in the same footprint from one satellite. They're going to both be picking up the same satellite. That interference correlates, and it kills your baseline. So, this is going to mean that we can do long baseline radio interferometry, but short baseline radio interferometry is going to become very, very difficult because you've got all this interference. How we deal with that is a problem we need to solve. But to put it in context, so he's going to launch 12,000 this year, just SpaceX, approval for another 30,000 requested. Across both hemispheres, we can see 10,000 stars with the naked eye on a clear night. You can imagine that's, we can, we're going to have way more satellites up there that we can see with the naked eye than we can actually see stars from a dark location. That's quite astonishing. So it is going to be a huge headache. So how do we get around that? Well, telescopes on the moon. Obvious solution. Why not? I made this picture in 2009. There was a paper that I saw then about putting telescopes on the moon. They were developing uh, liquid telescopes. You spin a, a liquid um, on, a, on a bench at about three miles an hour. It doesn't have to rotate fast, and you get a nice, perfect parabola. If you do this on the moon, you've got an instant telescope. The moon has lots and lots of advantages. It's got no atmosphere, none to speak of. It's got low gravity, so your mechanics don't have to be as beefy. 
Uh, it's got no people, it's got no streetlights, it's got no radio interference, especially if you go to the far side. So it's a very, very good place for lots of telescopes. And we already know how to build telescopes that can withstand space. We build satellites and we send them into space all the time. We know how to do that. So if you're going to go to the moon, though, telescopes with no moving parts work best. And telescopes that don't use mirrors work best because mirrors can get scratched. You get micrometeorites on the moon, they scratch your mirror, your mirror degrades. So you can build one of these spinning liquid mirrors. Now, on the Earth, people have experimented with mercury. Getting mercury to the moon, mercury's heavy. Mercury's expensive to get to the moon. Um, it's also not particularly good in the lunar atmosphere. It will just boil off. It will disappear. So what do we do instead? People are experimenting using ionic liquids, basically liquid salt, to do this instead. That has the advantage that it can cope in the, in the lunar environment, but also it weighs about the same as water. So in terms of launching it there, it's not as expensive as, as mercury. So we win both ways. In the radio, this is Arecibo, the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. Um, Arecibo doesn't move. It's a, built in a big cast in the ground. It sits there and it watches the sky move overhead. So if you're going to build a radio telescope on the moon, this is probably the way to go. You don't want expensive maintenance. Let's be honest, STFC are probably not going to pay for the observing trips. <laughs> Whatever we put there has to be simple. Now, this seemed rather fanciful back in 2009 when I, when I first looked at this, but I discovered yesterday that there's actually a meeting in March at the Royal Society on this very topic. So if you're interested in putting radio telescopes on the moon, or any kind of telescopes on the moon, you might want to register for this meeting. It's being organised by Professors Joe Silk, John Zanecki, Ian Crawford and Martin Elvis. So if you're interested, I'd recommend that you go. We could also put telescopes further out into deep space. So, uh, non-science fiction aficionados, this is the Argus Array from Star Trek The Next Generation. This is a subspace telescope. Subspace signals travel faster than light, so we can see things before they happen, which would be a neat trick. Um, we can put telescopes further out in space. Now, again, this is not so daft. We already are building a deep space telescope, deep space, not quite this deep, um, to look for gravitational waves. Gravitational waves on the ground are working beautifully well. The detectors are turning out new signals all the time. This looks a bit dark on this screen. Sorry about that. Um, this graphic is supposed to show um, the current black hole, stellar mass black holes at the top here. So this lot down here are the ones that have been detected electromagnetically, and these blue ones are the ones that have been detected in collisions by gravitational wave detectors. And down the bottom here, neutron stars. That's all very well. This is the the spectrum of gravitational waves, and terrestrial detectors are down here. This is where we get rotating neutron stars, supernovae, binary stellar mass black holes, and so on. If we want to look at the kind of dual supermassive black holes that you get when galaxies collide, which is my pet topic, then we need longer wavelengths. We need to go up the spectrum. And to do that, you need longer baselines. You get to the point where the baselines that you need to see these things are longer than the diameter of the planet Earth. So to see them, we have to go to space. We've got no choice. So that's what we're doing. This is an animation showing LISA, which is a space interferometer to detect gravitational waves. These three satellites are linked together by lasers, and they have three floating masses, one inside each spacecraft. And they measure their relative positions to a in really impressive degree of accuracy, which you have to do if you're looking for very tiny movements due to gravitational waves. Now, there's already been a Pathfinder that we've launched, we've tested, and it has come back, and actually it's performed far better than the specifications. So this is, this is going to happen in the next few years, which is really exciting. <coughs> so that's gravitational waves, black holes. What else is going to happen in the next few years? Longer-term predictions? Well, we're going to find more exoplanets, right? This is an easy one. This is a prediction I'm fairly, fairly certain is correct. The graphic at the bottom here, this is a, an animation made by Hugh Osborne, who um, I gather was rather irritated that as a PhD student when he made this, this is his most cited work, this graphic. None of the papers he's written, this has had more citations. This is showing you, over the last few hundred years, how many planets we've known about, just to show you how fast that rate of detection has been in the last few years. It's exactly the same data as in this plot, just presented in a different way. So these are the exoplanets we know about as of today. 
I got this graphic from the uh, NASA Exoplanet Archive on Monday. There's probably been a couple more since then. I haven't checked. Um, but with instruments like TESS, finding new exoplanets on a daily basis, this number is going to go up, and it's going to go up rapidly. Now, I did a very crude extrapolation and said, OK, assuming that we have, we take out, take out the, the big outliers, if you assume this rate is constant, how many exoplanets will we know by 2220 in 200 years? And my estimate was 21 million. Now, obviously, that's complete nonsense because you could extrapolate this in many different ways and you get wildly different numbers. But they are going to increase dramatically. And we're going to find lots of different ones and probably types of exoplanets that we haven't even dreamed of yet. <coughs> what else might happen? Longer term predictions. Anybody seen Beetlejuice recently? <laughs> This is a picture I took from Olsen Observatory up near Preston. And this was taken last year while I was out there doing some teaching. And this is, this is Beetlejuice, for those of you that don't know this guy. <laughs> I, I did a quiz once for my colleagues at Jodrell Bank Observatory, and it was worrying how much they didn't know that your average 10-year-old in a primary school does about this guy. <laughs> One day I'll do that quiz here, if you like. Anyway, um, Beetlejuice has faded by about a magnitude. That's a factor of two and a half just since October last year. So if you go out and look at the sky, it is noticeably fainter than it is in that picture relative to the other stars in Orion. Um, so there's a lot of speculation. This is a red giant star that at some point is going to go supernova. It's 11 times more massive than the sun. It's a star that will eventually at some point go supernova. So a lot of people are saying, oh, is this a precursor to the supernova event? Are we going to see this in the next few years? Well, possibly. Um, it might happen in the next few years. Um, equally, it might not happen for another 100,000 years. But that's my cheeky animation of what it might look like on the sky when it does. When it does, we'll see it during, during daylight. And for those pedants in the audience, no, it's not really going to look that big quite that fast. But if I made it a realistic size, you wouldn't see it. So, yes, this is art rather than science. So that's one thing that might happen in the next 200 years. I wouldn't hold your breath, though. The safest prediction that I could possibly make is that there's going to be stuff that we haven't predicted yet that's going to turn up, right? Unknown unknowns. Every time we build a new telescope with a new capability, the stuff that people remember that telescope for is not the stuff that we built it to do. It's the stuff that it found that we didn't know was there to be predicted in the first place. Every time we get an increase in capability, whether that's sensitivity, whether that's field of view, whether that's redshift, or in this case, currently, at the moment, one of the big ones is time domain, right? Every time multi-wavelength stuff led to lots of discoveries, gravitational waves. Now we've now got multi-messenger astronomy. Every time we get an increase in capability, we find stuff that we didn't know was there to be predicted. And I don't see why the next 200 years is, is going to be any different. And with cheap space launches, I think it's going to be easier for us to keep that multi-wavelength capability. So in the past, we've had times where there's been a dearth of X-ray telescopes, there's been a dearth of, of infrared, there's been a dearth of ultraviolet. With cheaper satellite launches, I think we can hopefully get around those problems in the future. And my final prediction, a slightly tongue-in-cheek one, as I hope befits the, the nature of the rest of the talk that I've given, is that in 200 years, our 400th anniversary meeting will be by hologram. <laughs> you thank Mandy Bailey for this idea. Now, rather than traveling to London, high carbon footprint. This would be simpler. Um, global warming, London might be underwater. Burlington House might be gone in 200 years. Okay, So this is one way we could get around that. Um, I would hope, though, that in 200 years, the gender balance might look a bit better than this. <laughs> I, I was going to try and Photoshop Emma Bunce in here, but I didn't have time. Um, so yeah, of course, none of us will be around for the 400th anniversary. But hopefully it will, it will look uh, slightly more balanced than that. So I hope you've enjoyed my ideas of what we're going to see in the next few years, certainly, if not the next 200 years. But I'd like to finish by just saying, well, over to you, what do you think? What have I missed? What do you think we're going to find in the next 200 years that we don't yet know about? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Megan, for that, that great talk using that, um, that well-known astronomical instrument, the, the crystal ball. Um, <laughs> but with what I'm sure Anton would say was great use of priors. 
And I, I'm trying to work out how I get Alan's beer into this, and I haven't quite managed that. Maybe some was used. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for Emma? Um, so for for, for uh, uh, Megan, sorry. At, at, the, at the back, Steve. Uh, yes, hello. Hope, uh, two part hopefully quite brief question, both about Starlink. Um, the image of the star field with the satellites going over, do we know if that's representative of the final spatial distribution? Because I understand they spread out quite slowly. Yeah. And the second part of the question is, it's a bit more philosophical. Um, <laughs> I know obviously there's a sort of reference to, you know, is internet important versus sort of water and other aid? But actually we know how important the internet is to an economy and to a... Uh, to a developing nation, so are we right to let increased complexities in our observations prevent what is ultimately an amazing tool, the internet, for these uh, other nations? Yeah, that's a good point. So in terms of the, the satellites um, themselves, yes, as they, as they launch, they're launched on a rocket and they all spread out from there. And at that point, they're in a low orbit, and yes, they are incredibly bright, easily naked eye. People have been reporting them as UFOs. Um, as they spread out, they get higher in their orbit, and they do become fainter, yes. So they become less of a problem to the visual astronomer without a telescope. If you've got a nice big sensitive, you know, 10 meter telescope this, with a wide field of view, they're still very much going to be a problem. Quite how much of a problem, I think, is to be determined as, you know, they get to their final orbits. I think, you know, we're in the early stages here. Now, SpaceX have they are aware that this is a problem. I think there was some chatter about this at the AAAS actually yesterday about this exact topic. And it's, they're aware it's a problem and they want to try and see if there's anything they can do. Now, the best thing you could do is make your solar panels dark, right? But that has obvious problems for your satellite operations if you do that. Um, so they're looking into how they can do it. Now, these things do only have a relatively short lifetime. They're only up there for a couple of years before they do orbit and they launch some new ones to replace them. So as the technology differs and evolves over time, hopefully it will become less of a problem. It's never going to go away. And certainly it doesn't matter what you do visually, it's always going to be a problem for radio telescopes. And there's no way to get around that. In terms of the philosophical question, you're right. Yes, internet is very, very helpful for, for even a developing economy, for, you know... Um, you're right, we have no right to say whether they should or shouldn't have it. Um, and that's a wider question that I think we all need to ask and think about. Thank you, Megan. One thing you didn't mention was AI, artificial intelligence. Do you see that with the amount of data we're getting as the next barrier where we'll find things we didn't even think of? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so for, for LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, AI is what's going to be processing the data. You know, th those pipelines will have to be intelligent. There will have to be some kind of capability in there that is you know, able to look at data and make an intelligent decision as to whether a particular signal is useful or not. And a lot of other bits of information are going to have to go into that. There's already large parts of astronomy that are using machine learning and developing tools to use that sort of thing anyway. And I think, yeah, that's only going to accelerate as we get larger and larger data sets in, in the future. The same with the square kilometre array. The data sets are, are immense. Even once you've done the initial processing of those data sets on site, you send them out to the astronomers, you're still talking vast amounts of data. And I think, yeah, in terms of if you want to start combining all of that data together, you could use machine learning to look at all of these archives together, something no human could possibly do. So look, compare all of those databases and look for patterns that you, know, you wouldn't think to look for yourself as a, as, a, as a human with a brain. Those computers can look for patterns that we wouldn't dream of seeing. So yeah, absolutely. Any other questions in that case? Megan, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. <laughs> <laughs>